Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. Let's talk video games and utilities. Probably two sectors of the stock market that are almost completely opposite. Utilities. We need electricity. We need natural gas. We need to be able to turn on our home, heat our home. You get the idea. Cook. Utilities are supposed to be sleepy. They're meant for the elderly. And they're meant for orphans. They pay a steady income, a dividend. They're not coming out with electricity 2.0. Well, they kind of did with solar and wind, right? But the grid's not ready for that. So they're raising prices so they can get the grid more ready for electric cars and AI, which consumes an enormous amount of electricity. So what I'm telling you, utilities are very sexy all of a sudden. They're supposed to be sleepiest of the sectors. You can take a look at XLU. It's an exchange traded fund. It's up 14.5% this year. That's pretty good. Plus it pays a dividend. I'd take that. And it should ask you the question, what gives? It's the data center and AI that I was talking about. The excitement has spread from semiconductors like NVIDIA's to chatbots like Google's and Microsoft's and ChatGPT. We're starting to see some revenue subscription models come in. So the software is starting to make some of the money. But utilities are doing quite well. Constellation Energy, Vistra, NRG Energy, all have surged more than 60 percent this year. Constellation Energy, ticker symbol CEG, Vistra, VST, and NRG Energy, ticker symbol Energy, have all surged 60 percent. And you're saying like, wow, that's like NVIDIA type numbers. Maybe even a little bit better. Constellation has a market cap of $70 billion. They're in the sweet spot for AI. It has the biggest fleet of nuclear power plants in the United States, allowing it to produce clean energy around the clock. Two features highly prized by data centers, clean energy and 24-7. Constellation can sell power at its competitive prices without needing government permissions to raise rates. It's not shy about seizing the opportunity. They have a CEO who talks about AI. Vistra and Energy have benefited from similar dynamics. Both companies offered rosy outlooks based on expected demand from data centers. So they're in AI. Sleepy old utilities. Constellation stock is at 216 up from 80 a year ago. Winter, winter, chicken dinner, big time. Not bad. So the ETF, if you want wide, broad exposure, is XLU. The individual stocks are NRG, VST, and CEG. Just throwing it down there for you. I'm not saying you should do it, because I don't know you. I work with a financial planner, and I have my retirement funds managed by professionals. My growth portfolio, it's, it's large. I do that myself. I don't know you. We're different types of investors. Do you see what I'm saying? So energy is sexy. Now, what about video games? Microsoft has announced that Call of Duty will only be available on their subscription service, Game Pass. That doesn't make sense. Because it's a game that can charge 60 to $80. Why are they doing that? It's interesting, right? Because they went through that whole hullabaloo to acquire Game Pass, uh, to acquire 
Activision Blizzard. They said, you know, we're not going to make it exclusive on streaming um, Game Pass. We won't do that. No. Oh, sure. That's what they did. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? They're not even very good liars. Um, I. What's interesting about this is it's kind of conservative. You know how I was just talking about utilities that are kind of conservative are now sexy? Putting Call of Duty on a Game Pass, and Game Passes, they don't think that they're charging $9.99 to $17 a month usually. You get hundreds of games. People will end up paying Microsoft less for the new Call of Duty than it would have if they made it the traditional approach. Instead, it's going to draw new users to the Game Pass who will end up paying it more over the long term. It seems like if they gave it six months to sell exclusively and then put it on Game Pass, that might have been a better way. Microsoft's new plan will get people paying Microsoft less than the traditional approach of selling it at stores. But the hope is that'll draw new users to Game Pass who will end up paying more over the longer term. Last year, Microsoft did it with a science fiction game called Starfield, which brought record number of new subscriptions in a single day. Microsoft's acquisition of Activision took 21 months. The prolonged review was partly over concerns that Call of Duty would give Microsoft an unfair advantage in cloud gaming. A new and more affordable way of accessing games. If it were to decide in the future to withhold the series from rivals. Microsoft pledged not to do that. Interesting, right? We'll see how it plays out. There's another piece of video game news in the world today. Take Two Interactive. Take Two Interactive has said that they are not coming out with the new version of their game until they get to 2025. Grand Theft Auto 6 not coming out till Christmas of 2025. It was expected spring of 2025. So they'll sell that one individually, not on a subscription. That'll be the biggest form of entertainment ever. Eclipsing every movie ever made. Grand Theft Auto 6 coming out Christmas 2025. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. Saturday, June 22nd, join Rob Black in San Mateo for Pints and Portfolios, a less formal event at a local watering hole for those close to retirement with 500000 or more in investable assets. Drop by June 22nd from noon to 2 for a little sunshine, some financial chit-chat, and a complimentary portfolio review or financial snapshot from CFP Ryan Ignacio and CFP Julie O'Rourke from EP Wealth Advisors. This financial snapshot can provide you with a second opinion analysis of where you are and highlight areas for improvement and opportunities for growth. Go to robblackshow.com and click the events tab. Find pints and portfolios and click to register. You'll answer a few simple questions about your situation and your confirmation email will provide all the details on the location of the event in San Mateo and how to schedule your portfolio review. Space is limited and registration is required, so go to robblackshow.com to Day. That's robblackshow.com. Welcome back in, Rob Black and your money. I'm Rob Black. Joining me today, as he does on Wednesdays, Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com. It's a big day on Wall Street in my mind. I know that I probably say that too many times throughout the year. But this morning, we got news out of Target that gave us insights into the consumer of the U.S. Tonight, we're going to get news into NVIDIA. And if you take a look back at since November, December, January, February, March, the stock market was really building a big rally around the idea of artificial intelligence and tech stocks. Uh, then April came along and things slipped, but May came right back with, let's see what NVIDIA has to say. Is this another run like we had in the 1990s with the internet and building all the hardware to support it? Is AI building all the hardware to support it? Let's talk about UK inflation, Target and NVIDIA and other issues with Patrick O'Hare, briefing.com. Patrick, how are you today? Hey, good morning, Rob. I'm doing well. Thank you. It's kind of a big day for me. It's it's financial headline news. Is it a big day for you, or am I embellishing a bit? <laughs> yeah, it is a big day. Um, you can see, really, you know, the market is kind of 
just has this pent up energy here waiting to see uh, what happens with NVIDIA after the report uh, following today's close. Um, I don't think there's any question in the market's mind that NVIDIA is going to come in with better than expected results. That's right. Uh, the, the question hanging out there is, you know, how will the market respond to those results and guidance and what effect might that have on the broader market, um, uh, which is, you know, certainly been lifted uh, with NVIDIA support, uh, along with some of the other mega cap stocks. But clearly a lot of AI enthusiasm has been unfolding here uh, this year, certainly, but obviously in, in, in more recent weeks. Uh, and so that's why there's a lot of attention on NVIDIA's report tonight. Amazon said today that they're going to revamp Alexa and maybe make it a subscription model. Uh, because right now, the AI and Alexa and Siri just isn't all that great. So we may see a broadening out, but we're also seeing utilities and copper start to rally around AI, which is interesting because that could lift the overall market. That's what I'm looking at. But um, we do have other things to think about other than just NVIDIA's report after the markets. Target came out this morning. They're down 10% following disappointing results and guidance. Um Oscar's got a subscription model that Wall Street seems to love. Deep, deep discounts because of that subscription. Walmart seems to have more focus on discounts year-round, maybe even more product than Target. What is Target doing wrong, or what did you see in their results that's uh, playing out on Wall Street today? Well, it's kind of you know what Target's been speaking about in, in more recent reports, really, is, is that they're seeing their consumer become uh, more discerning as it relates to discretionary purchases. Uh, Walmart even, you know, said said the same. But the thing is, is that Walmart has a much larger grocery business than Target does. And so uh, so there's been a lot of um, uh, trading down, if you will, uh, from, you know, consumers that might be considered middle income or even higher income consumers feeling stretched, trading down into Walmart to take advantage of lower grocery prices uh, and then also doing some, you know, residual shopping there. But uh, it just seems that Target is just kind of caught in, in a, you know, difficult spot at the moment. Um, it's, it's not the lowest priced retailer. It's not the highest priced retailer. Uh, but consumers overall uh, certainly in that lower to middle income demographic are becoming a little bit more discerning here as to you know how to stretch their dollar. And so uh, Target consequently gets pinched by that somewhat, and, and that's shown up in some, some really kind of lackluster sales results, both uh, in total sales and comparable sales, uh, whereas Walmart is, uh, you know, delivering some nice positive comp growth uh, that shows how it can kind of, you know, cater – uh, to the needs of all income demographics, but certainly that uh, uh, lower to middle income demographic that's uh, feeling stretched right now. I sometimes like to be funny or try to be funny when say the hip bone's connected to the elbow, but I, it's not lost on me that McDonald's and Wendy's are introducing value meals when Walmart CEO earlier this, uh, or I guess last week said that eating out at McDonald's is four times more expensive than eating at home. And um, all these companies are kind of fighting for that slowing consumer. Do you think we should be worried about the slowing consumer, Patrick? Well, you know, when you take into account that consumer spending uh, accounts for 70% of of GDP, um, you do have to um, take stock of what's what's going on in in terms of the consumer spending world. And um, I think we have a, you know, economy that is, um, you know, turning to somewhat of a bifurcated type of economy as it relates to spending activity because uh, you're still seeing good resilience at the high end, uh, which uh, is less uh, um, vulnerable to rising rates and, and, some of the, and some of the inflation pressures. Not all of them, but some of them. Uh, whereas that lower to middle income demographic, as we've discussed, is, uh, you know, has more difficulty in uh, you know, in, in terms of their ability to spend on discretionary items versus those, those staple items. And that's kind of where more of the spending seems to be gravitating toward for those, for that demographic. It's, uh, it's spending in terms of uh, need and not necessarily in terms of want, whereas that upper income consumer uh, still can spend according to want uh, as well as to need. Uh, so, 
to the extent that you get a slowdown in consumer spending activity and lower GDP growth, uh, that does translate over into the stock market eventually, uh, or so one would think, in terms of uh, more pressure on earnings growth. Uh, and that's kind of one of the questions right now that's hanging over things here, that the market at a record high doing very well, um, you know, on the hope that the Fed's going to be cutting rates. Uh, but uh, but also kind of trading at a stretch valuation that's predicated on the idea that earnings estimates are going to continue to go up. Uh, and if they do not, because growth is slowing, uh, then you have a stock market that's going to be more challenged here uh, and perhaps subject to more pullback effort than what we've seen. Now, I like to think of myself as insightful enough to figure out targets tell us about the consumer weakness. That's kind of a negative for the economy. NVIDIA is telling us about opportunities for tech companies as well as energy companies as well as copper companies. But you kind of stumped me this morning when I opened your page one at briefing.com and I saw the words UK inflation. Um, what's UK inflation have to do with me today? Why do I need to c care about what people are doing in London? Right. Well, you know, the, the way that it translated it over uh, to the market this morning when I was writing the page one column is that you saw some weakness in the equity futures market, but you also huh? saw a, a bump in market rates that uh, occurred overnight, really, uh, and following that UK inflation report that was that was hotter than expected. And because it was hotter than expected, it, it sort of tamped down expectations for a rate cut in June by the Bank of England. And, uh, and the overarching point, though, is that, um, you know, inflation is not um, just a U.S. issue. Um, it's still uh, an issue for other developed countries, and we saw that in the U.K. numbers this morning. And, uh, and as a result, you know, you have a market there that's now contemplating or needing to recalibrate, I should say, uh, the prospect of rate cuts uh, and the timing of those rate cuts. Uh, the U.S. has had to do that uh, already, uh, but obviously there's a lot of pent-up hope that the Fed's going to be able to cut rates before the end of the year. So if we find ourselves in a similar position where we have to recalibrate again and those rate cuts get pushed out into 2025 uh, or the specter of possibly another rate hike comes back into play, uh, then it becomes, you know, again, a, a challenging proposition here for the U.S. equity market, which is trading at a higher valuation, a full valuation uh, that rests in large part, too, on the notion that rates will be coming down. And so we have to keep a close eye on that. So that's a little bit of that tangential connection uh, to what's happening with U.K. inflation. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's something that, you know, could boil up here again in the U.S. Uh, and certainly not what the Fed or anyone wants to see, but obviously everyone's keeping a close watch on that. Inflation seems to move in one direction on the way up, higher. And on the way down, it's a little bit bumpier, a little bit more turbulent. But we're not going to talk to turbulence because there's a horrible story this week about turbulence. Um, we've got about a minute or two. Anything that you want to throw in as a, a softball question towards you that you might be able to hit out of the park? <laughs> um, well, you know, in, this week here, as we lead into a, a three-day weekend, um, I think that you see a lot of uh, fading interest uh, once we get past this NVIDIA earnings report. Um and, you know, I, I, one thing that I've been kind of turning over in my mind, too, is just having heard from uh, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon earlier in the week mm -hmm. that, you know, that they're really not going to be buying back stock at the high prices the stock is trading at. Uh, and so it does give you some pause to, to think about how, uh, you know, certain stocks, individual stocks, you know, that are trading at not just high prices, that doesn't mean anything in and of itself, but a high valuation, that does mean something. Um, you have to be more discerning here on the investor side of things now, and it's not really just a, a kind of, you know, buy it all and, and, and go, to, go to sleep, because um, you have a, a market cap, S&P 500, that, that has a full valuation. So you have to be more discerning in your individual stock purchases uh, so as to mitigate the, the risk that would come if there's a disappointment uh, and you get a correction. Thanks very much. It's Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com. Always insightful. His page one is just chock full of ideas. And like I said, I woke up this morning and saw UK inflation. Why do I care? And he certainly gave us a, a good explanation on that. Good insights into Target and wonderful insights into what NVIDIA might have to say and the importance it has on the overall market. I use briefing.com two or three times a day. I start with his page one every day. I end the week 
or every week I end the, um, you know, what happened review with the big picture. But in between, there's a lot of things like in play economic calendars, what's happening today on the market and kind of a big picture. Lots of good stuff there. You can find him at briefing.com. It's a reliable source of domestic and international news that you can use. Find him at briefing.com. Find me at robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. This interview featured on the Rob Black Show is brought to you by EP Wealth. Learn more at robblack.com. So 25 years ago, I met CFP Chad Burton. And like I alluded to earlier in the show, I was a registered investment advisor. I could do portfolios in my mind better than anyone else. The problem was I couldn't do things like charitable planning, getting kids into college funding issues, uh, insurance strategies, real estate issues. I had the mind of a 25 year old kid, so to speak. So I wasn't quite there with all my developed financial ideas that a CFP has and practices, um, whether it be alternative income streams from you know dividends or alternative real estate, alternative debt, alternative equities. Um, there's a lot going on there and there's a lot of products to kind of piece together to make everything, all the levers work at the same time. And it's quite a machine when it is working all at the same time. Chad, um, another thing that I can't do is estate planning. Um, I needed your guidance to help me with some ideas on my own personal estate. Let's talk about estate planning changes that are coming up and what are your thoughts on estate planning as part of a financial plan? Yeah, well, you're talking about the changes that are coming up. I think that's what stalls a lot of people as they hear about different things in the news. For example, there was a big change in estate tax law in 2017, but that expires in 2026. And so everybody in terms of really advanced estate planning, Rob, which is setting up trust for your spouse or kids while you're alive and, you know, doing these irrevocable type trusts and other tax planning, everybody's kind of on hold until after the November elections. Um, But at the same time, if you want to be able to act on something that's going to expire by the end of 2025, you need to get teed up and be into that relationship with that attorney now because they're going to be slammed. Like they're, they're, they probably will have a tough time getting to anybody new versus the people that they've already done some planning for. So do not hold off on your core documents. So if you're listening in a state like California or Oregon, where probate is very expensive and time consuming, it's very important to have a living trust. And so a lot of people think of a living trust as it must be for tax purposes. Really, it's more for What happens to you if you're incapacitated, but still alive and need help, right? So think of mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, both in a nursing home, who's handling their financial affairs, who steps in and takes over. So the core documents are going to be a living trust and a power of attorney, and that allows people to step in. So a living trust is going to help people step in to deal with non-retirement account issues, where a power of attorney is still needed to deal with like your retirement accounts, Okay. So okay. living trust is essentially a document that says, if I'm incapacitated, this is who takes over. If I die, this is who gets the money. And the main idea of it is to also avoid probate costs, which are very expensive in especially California. And so, you know, if you're spending, you know, 3,500, 4,500 bucks on a living trust that has a healthcare directive, power of attorney and a will, it's, it's going to save your heirs a lot more than that in terms of attorney's fees and court costs and things like that. So before, before the pandemic, I heard probate costs were roughly $50,000. I have to imagine they're, they're more now. And that's just something you automatically go through, um, determine, like, make sure that your house was your house and it wasn't in someone else's name or something like that. And no one has liabilities, uh, claims against you. So anyway, finish your thought. Yeah. And there's, and states have certain, you know, amounts that they allow to charge per the value of the state, but what it's the gross value of the state, Rob. So you could have a, a $5 million estate, right? In, in level where it's a house and some investment accounts. But let's say that the $3 million house has a $2 million loan. You're still paying probate costs on the $3 million house. It's not 3 million minus the 2 million. So it's it's kind of a, a pain. It's a bit of a racket, but it is what it is. And you got to deal with it. And, and part of the, and the best part of those documents, like I said, is really what happens if you need help while you're alive? Because a lot of people get into that situation. And um, so each the, the the main documents that everybody needs is a living trust that says, this is what happens if I pass away. And this is what happens if I need help while I'm alive. 
Um, you still have a will, which basically says, if I forgot to put anything in the trust, put it in when I die. Um, or sometimes you can have specific things like I want my car to go to so-and-so and, you know, personal items, those types of things. Um, but you also need a power of attorney because that's for, especially for retirement accounts and then a healthcare directive, which is what happens if you need care, you know, pulling the plug, being on life support, those types of things. And so you, you've got to make a lot of those decisions. It's harder when you're younger, right? Cause when you're younger, you're like, who's going to handle my kids. If both of us pass away and I have young children, who are, who's going to be the guardian for my children? And then who, if I'm leaving them money in the form of, let's say I saved in a retirement account or I have a life insurance policy, who's going to handle the money. And even, you know, when I first had the first of my four kids, it was okay. Who's, who's going to, who's going to handle the kids? Well, that was an easy issue. It would be my mom, but I wouldn't have her handle the money, for example. <laughs> so, so it'd be, you know, somebody else was going to step in and, and be the trustee on the assets that I leave them. And so a lot of times that's the most difficult conversation that you're having when you're married with younger kids is it, no, it's my, my brother, my sister. No, it's going to be my brother or my sister. And then we'll wait, they're terrible with money, but great with kids. So that you, and you've got to talk those things through so that you can get these documents done. But the important thing is once they're done and they're really easy to change and update. So once you have a living trust and a will and all these documents, you can do amendments. If something changes, you have more children, you get a divorce or what you can, you can do amendments. And so once you do these things, it's not written in stone forever. They're called uh, revocable living trusts because you can totally get rid of them if you want to, and you can change them whenever you want. So even though the, the estate tax laws change in 2026, that's not going to change the core documents that everybody needs. So they should get it done now. That way you already have a relationship with an attorney. And so if you are very wealthy, that's typically you know couples that are over 13 million, let's say right now. Uh, then you'll be teed up and ready to go to do advanced estate planning to save taxes based on what happens to the law in 2026. Yeah, it's interesting that you brought up the, you know, who do you make the parent of your kids? And we had an obvious one with my wife's sister, but I didn't like my wife's sister's husband. So we ultimately went with some neighbors that they had raised good kids and we were like, that's who we want, if that makes sense. But um, anyway... Yeah, absolutely. I've seen that quite a bit. Okay, good, good. And then it could stay in the same community and kind of stuff. I mean, it's really weird looking back at that because uh, time flies, man. I'm getting old. Um, you want to talk a little insurance strategies? Well, first and foremost, I do. I I want to say I want to agree with what Chad said about estate planning. Time to do it is now, and get that relationship going because it is a process. Now, let's talk insurance strategies. You were bringing this one up. Um, California's got something very unique. Um, I do stories for the local news all the time about uh, nationwide or state farm or cutting homeowners insurance. What are you hearing from your side of the fence as a financial planner and California insurance issues? Well, we're getting calls all the time from people that, hey, I've got to notice that my homeowner's insurance is not being renewed. And so, you know, a lot of states, because California wasn't allowing certain risk modeling and things like that to occur, a lot of companies have just pulled out of California altogether. And so um, the issue is becoming, for those that, you know, I've still seen a lot of people wanting to retire when they retire, leaving the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that this problem probably will get fixed and play out over time. And, and one of the things to think about for those that are retiring, and I want to, I want to move somewhere else in California, but where I'm wanting to move to is also having massive homeowners insurance problems. What's nice about, there's two things, right? When you sell your primary residence that you've owned for over a certain period of time, usually it's two out of the last five years, right? Mm -hmm. You can exclude the first half a million dollars of gain that you have but you'll pay capital gains taxes on the rest. And now under Prop 19, you have two years to be able to, you know, sell your existing home and use that lower property tax base to move anywhere else in California. Um, so if you're not really sure where you want to move or where you want to move is having massive insurance problems, you know, maybe you kind of float around and rent for a little bit and figure out where do you want to land if you're moving out of, you know, the Bay Area and want to move, you know, somewhere south, let's say and see if this all plays out a little bit because recently somebody put an offer i know in a home that was outside of the the bay area where they're moving and in, in closer to southern california but they had to put a contingency on it to say 
you know, here's the offer, but I need 17 days to see if I can even get this thing insured. So a lot of people losing their basic insurance and they're having to go to like uh, Pure or Chubb. Um, uh, I, I will say if anybody has a relationship with USAA, that's anybody military in their family. Mm -hmm. If USAA can insure it, they can outsource to um, those companies as well. So it's a, it's, it's an interesting and rough time to be a, you know, property casualty insurance agent in the state of California. When you have all these companies changing, we had these other clients that they, they wanted to, um, they, they wanted, they needed to put their, their rental property that was in Penaluma into their living trust. And so they just notified the insurance company, Hey, this, this insurance policy really needs to be to name our living trust because that's what actually owns the asset. And the company then said, oh, well, we're, we're, you changed your policy, so we're canceling you effective immediately. And so they had to argue with, the, get the agent on. It took a couple of days to say, this is not a change of policy. This is just, you, when, you're, when you have an asset that's owned by a living trust, it's not really a change of ownership. It's still you. It's still your tax ID number that owns it. It's just a registration thing. And so th those are the kind of issues that we're dealing with. So the rules that California put in place and then the, the fires on top of it essentially screwed up the insurance industry altogether um, in the state of California. So something is going to have to change drastically. And, you know, if you got two years to use that Prop 19, you could probably be willing to bet it'll probably settle out a little bit in the next two years. And a lot of what Chad's talking about is what financial planners do. They, can, they get all your documents. They hold them in one secure online vault that you can get to. Uh, when you need them, whether it be your taxes, your real estate issues, your insurance policies, your taxes, uh, tax projections, it's it's all there. It's a really cool idea of working with the CFP is getting all your financial information working together. What's the best way to choose a financial advisor? Download our guide at robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. My financial brain gets its love and teaching when I sit next to CFP Chad Burton and we talk financial planning issues. Um, when I was a younger man, I never thought I was going to be wildly successful and I've done pretty well in my life. I'm, I'm very modestly saying that um, I've done really well. And um, when I was younger, I never thought I was going to be in a position to give money away charitably. And at a recent fundraiser, I was able to raise the paddle for a big donation tied towards a soccer field felt pretty good. I don't know how tax efficient that was. Let's talk about some of the charitable planning strategies and how we can use them to financially benefit ourselves while doing the charitable thing and helping others. Chad, what are some ideas we should be chatting about? Well, first of all, if you raise that paddle, Rob, I hope you did not write a check. I hope you'd say, okay, hey, charity or nonprofit organization, 503C or whatever, and a lot of schools have one. Mm -hmm. um, instead of writing you a, uh, you know, a check, I'm going to donate shares of my highly appreciated Apple stock. Because when you, when you transfer the stock directly to the charity, you still get a tax deduction. Um, and then when the charity sells the stock, they don't pay the taxes on the gain. And then you can take your cash. If you still want to own that same stock, just buy it back. And you've upgraded your cost basis and you've gotten rid of a 23.8% federal tax and anywhere from a 9 to 13% state tax that you still benefited the charity. They still got everything, 100% of every dollar. You just cut the IRS out of the situation legally. So one of the first things that our advisors ask for is a tax return, because I can look at a tax return and I can look at your itemized deductions and note how much you're giving to charity. Are there better ways to do that that benefit you and your family? Um, uh, you know, what are you getting from dividends and interest? How is that? Uh, where are your assets being held? I can see all that on your um, your tax return and your different schedules, your Schedule D, your Schedule E, or I mean, sorry, Schedule B. Um, and really start to put together a puzzle. So if I have a tax return and a couple of investment account statements, I can really look at everything uh, and come up with some of those strategies. Which is if one you of the have, first things you ask people for when they're looking for a financial planner. You say, give me your taxes, give me your financial statements. You plug them into the software. The software kind of helps you parse and see all the everything in a, a clear, singular way. Um, that's one of the advantages of working with the CFP. But finish. Yeah, I mean, it, and you you hit it right on, Rob, because we have a, a portal that, you know, we talk about that you run, you hear the ad all the time, our, our wealth, our financial planning portal, which takes all of your accounts and everything in live 
time. You can see it all in one place, but it runs it through the financial planning projections that we do. Mm -hmm. So when I have somebody that's really serious that, hey, I want to work with one of your advisors or you, we basically give them a shell of that portal. They can upload um, either uh, Excel file of all their positions by account plus a tax return. And we can use all that, plug it in. And so that when we're doing the first meeting, which is a meeting that to get to know each other. Is this a good relationship? We want to make sure that we can add value to people's lives um, by taking them on as a client. So it, so it makes sense for everyone. Right. And so part of that first initial process is let's look at what you have. We'll tell you how much it's going to cost and what we think we can do for you. So if we can get all of that information before the first meeting, even if we don't end up engaging, your people still get a ton out of that initial meeting. Um, Maybe it's just a, hey, you're doing great. Keep what you're doing, what you're doing. Um, or maybe it's the, here's a bunch of things that we can do for you. And this is going to definitely be a great relationship. Either way, it's, you know, it's part of the initial process. It doesn't cost money because we got to make sure that it's a good long-term relationship. That's what everybody's looking for, right? Whether it's love life or financial life. <laughs> that's one of the benefits of coming to these events, whether they're my pints and portfolios or they're your wealth preservation and retirement planning seminars is that we do offer, we'll collect those documents through a secure download. We'll give you some feedback. We'll see if there's a fit. Um, if you can't see value from that initial reaction, there's that's that's the issue. But you'll typically find that CFPs can help you. Um, any other thoughts you want to hit real quick in this segment? Uh, Charity-wise, so there's, there's other options too that are so great. Donor advised funds, Fidelity and Schwab have them. So let's say you have a certain amount of charity that you want. I, I'm always giving five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a year. Well, you can, in one fell swoop, donate you know five, 10 years worth of that uh, goal into a donor advised fund by transferring a, some appreciated stock into the donor advised fund. You get an immediate tax deduction. You can sell it, reinvest it in a more conservative portfolio and then dole the money out to charity over time. Once you're age 70 and a half, your charitable gifting should probably switch and come out of your IRA because you can give up to a hundred grand a year out of your IRA to charities without paying taxes. And then there's so many advantages of charitable remainder trusts if you want to diversify without paying capital gains on a highly concentrated stock portfolio, create income while you're alive and have a certain amount go to charity when you die. That charitable remainder trust is one of my favorite planning techniques. Um, so anybody that has way too much of one stock should consider that if they have a concentration issue, but they also have charitable intent, it is a fantastic strategy. That's good to know. Um, and again, these are things that they're not in the newspaper and they're advanced concepts that you get to educate yourself on every year and or probably be more products coming out. The donor advised funds are something I never heard of until I met you. And um, I think I've only heard of them in the last 10 years. Does that sound about right? Um, they've been around for a long, long time. I think they've just gotten a little bit more popular and easy to use. Like Fidelity and Schwab both have really good ones. Um, you know, easy to set up, easy to transfer stock into them. So that's great. Uh, I think, there, there's I think maybe uh, maybe what I'm saying is now that I'm getting wealthier and closer to retirement, I'm actually paying <laughs> attention to the things that I used to go, ah, I'll do that later. Well, it's so interesting too, because those people that I have, clients are, most of them are very charitably inclined. And what they're doing with donating their time to charities and and money, it's like it, they just continue to network and benefit in other ways from it yep. that make what they gave away um, seem like peanuts. So it's that whole, you know, what you put out in the universe, you get back. It, it really works. I like that. Um there's some truth to that, too. Saturday, June 22nd, join Rob Black in San Mateo for Pints and Portfolios, a less formal event at a local watering hole for those close to retirement with 500000 or more in investable assets. Drop by June 22nd from noon to 2 for a little sunshine, some financial chit-chat, and a complimentary portfolio review or financial snapshot from CFP Ryan Ignacio and CFP Julie O'Rourke from EP Wealth Advisors. This financial snapshot can provide you with a second opinion analysis of where you are and highlight areas for improvement and opportunities for growth. Go to robblackshow.com and click the events tab. Find pints and portfolios and click to register. You'll answer a few simple questions about your situation and your confirmation email will provide all the details on the location of the event in San Mateo and how to schedule your portfolio review. Space is limited and registration is required, so go to robblackshow.com today. That's robblackshow.com. Come. 